Up next, we have a very tall man. Um, he writes books that sell well and go through real publishers, of all things. Um, and his new book is going to be a movie, I believe? We hope. At some point, maybe? Um, uh, I think a number of you are actually here specifically for him, because again, you know, like, um, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Mr. Paul <Turner. laughs> Thank you, Sean, for an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I do what little I can, which is typically there. All right. Um, yeah, so my A Head Full of Ghosts came out last June. Uh, you know, it's been a pretty exciting year for me. You know, as you mentioned, it was optioned by Focus Features and the two screenplay, or screenwriters are working on a screenplay as we speak. Hopefully they don't screw it up. Uh, <laughs> So I'm just gonna read like one page because I know like I have a lot of friends here who have, uh, uh, who have heard me read a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna read a little tiny section from a head full of ghosts that I've never read out loud. So hopefully it goes well. Uh, for those, I guess I should give it like a brief summary. It's I obnoxiously call it my postmodern secular exorcism novel. Um, and there's a family that live in Beverly, Massachusetts. There's two two sisters, Marjorie, who's 14 and uh, her younger sister Mary, who's eight. And actually, most of the book is being remembered by Ari, uh, Mary, excuse me, years later, uh, you know, 15 years after her sister actually goes through uh, an attempted exorcism while being on a reality show. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on. So this tiny little scene I'm taking from is they're actually sort of just sitting around watching TV waiting for the priests to get the okay from the church to... Uh, you know, approve them of an exorcist, or an exorcism, excuse me. Dad gave me thumbs up and said, woo, but his enthusiasm for my performance was lacking. Before they could start back in on each other, I pointed at the TV and said, maybe they'll finally find Bigfoot this time. Marjorie said, this isn't the Bigfoot show, monkey. We were pleased and shocked that Marjorie was, act was casually interacting with us. Barry... <laughs> made that camera rolling motion with his hands, desperately wanting one of us to respond, to goose the conversation going forward. Dad said, right, uh, it's a show called Survivor Man. I said, yeah, I know, but he's way deep in the woods all by himself. That's where Bigfoot lives, so maybe he'll see one. I don't think so, sweetie. Dad was badly overacting. He had that fake smile on his face, the one that looked painful to wear. I said, I bet he heard one, but didn't know it was a Bigfoot making that noise because he's not an expert. I punctuated it with a one-handed cartwheel. Dad said, of course he's an expert. No, he's not a Bigfoot expert. I looked to Barry and then to Ken, looking for some sign of approval that we were doing and talking about the right things in the right ways. There was a lull, and Barry said, what do you think, Sarah? Is this guy a Bigfoot expert? Mom said, what? Oh, sorry. Then put her phone down on the end of the table and crossed her arms. He's not a Bigfoot expert. He's just a, what, survivor man? I said, it sounds like a superhero name. He needs a cape. Mom gave me a sad smile, like she just remembered that I was there and had been there for a long time. She said, no capes, like the character from one of my favorite movies, The Incredibles. At the same time, Marjorie said, a cape he made out of moss and twigs, but she mumbled. And it wasn't a weird, creepy, she's possessed mumble, but her previously normal, I'm barely interested in what you're talking about mumble. I heard her and understood her. Mom did too, because she laughed. Marjorie added, in tight superhero underwear made from squirrel pelts. Mom said, it's where he puts his nuts. <laughs> so, it's the Lovecraft Society's first nut joke. Is that true? It's a long setup for a nut joke. Uh, all right, so actually, the main part that I'm gonna read, and. Uh, yeah, not too, too much, but um, in June I have a novel called Disappearance at Devil's Rock coming out. It's Hardy Boys fan fiction. Um, <laughs> it's not, but it sort of sounds like it. Uh, this is what, you know, for writers out there, you, when you start a book, you're better off starting with a title in mind, because when you don't have a title in mind, you end up with Disappearance at Devil's Rock. Uh, no, I like the title. It'll, it'll, people will dig it. Um, the book itself... <laughs> is set in, um, 
It's set in southeastern Massachusetts in the Easton, Sharon, Canton area. I don't know if you, any of you are familiar. And a lot of the action takes place at Borderland State Park, which is an actual park. Um, and so a lot of the physical things that get referred to, not necessarily what I'm reading, but you know, there's a lot of act, or there's a lot of the books or novels action that takes place at Borderland. And you know, all these things are real places. Like there's a place called Split Rock that I hike to quite frequently. That becomes like a key central part of the book. Although I do rename Easton Ames, just, I don't know, for fun, just in case Easton people get mad at me. Um, so anyway, I'm going to read the first chapter, and then maybe a piece of something a little bit later. And uh, the first chapter is called Elizabeth and the Call. <clears throat> Elizabeth is not dreaming. There's a ringing sound coming from far away, from elsewhere in the house, not the ringing of actual bells, but the digital trill of the landline phone. The phone is cordless, cheap, neglected, often left uncharged and to be found more times than not, wedged beneath the couch cushions alongside pistachio shells, pens, and hair elastics. Elizabeth actively despises the landline's inefficiency in regard to their everyday lives. The only calls the phone receives are credit card offers, scam vacation prizes, charities and fringe political groups looking for money, and the occasional mass recorded message from the town of Ames broadcasting the closing of schools during snowstorms. When the kids were little, Elizabeth wanted to keep the landline so that they'd be able to dial 911 should anything bad happen. That was the phrase she used with her moon-eyed munchkins as she flailed at describing the nebulous and exciting emergency protocol of the Sanderson household. Fast forward past those early years, which were harder than she would ever admit, and all three Sandersons have smartphones. There's really no need for the landline anymore. It survives because it is inexplicably cheaper for her to keep the phone bundled with her cable and internet. It's maddening. There's a ringing sound coming from far away, from elsewhere in the house, and not from the cell phone under her pillow. Elizabeth fell asleep waiting for the Star Trek phaser tone that announces a text from her 13 going on 14 year old son, Tommy. A simple text is a non-negotiable part of the deal when sleeping over at someone else's house, even Josh's. She has already seen an evolution, or devolution, of communication from Tommy over the course of the summer, reflected in his sleepover texts. In mid-June, it was, I'm going to bed now, Mom, which a few weeks later became Night Mom, then became Night, and then GN. And if Tommy could have texted an irritated grunt, his subverbal <laughs> communication method of the moment, particularly whenever Elizabeth or his 11-going-on-12-year-old sister Kate asked him to do something, he would have. And now in mid-August, the exact date having changed to August 16th, only a collection of minutes ago, there's no text at all. 1.28 a.m., the landline stops ringing. The silence that replaces it is loaded with the dread of possibility. Elizabeth sits up and double and triple checks her cell phone. There are no new texts. Tommy and his friend Luis are sleeping over at Josh's house. They've been on a sleepover rotation for a month now. Tommy, Josh, and Luis, the three amigos. She called them that earlier in the summer when the boys were over and watching all three movies of the Batman trilogy. Tommy groaned at her. Louise said, hey, is that a Mexican joke? And Tommy's face turned redder than a stop sign while the rest of them laughed their asses off. Elizabeth is out of bed. She is 42 and has large, dark brown eyes that always look a little heavy with sleep and straight shoulder-length brown hair going gray on the sides. She wears thin shorts and a tank top, and the pale skin of her arms and legs is chilled now that she's out from under the blanket. The noisy air conditioning ticks into life, swirling winds of cold, stale air. Kate must have sneakily turned down the thermostat down below 70 degrees, which is totally ridiculous given she sleeps in a sweatshirt and covered in two comforters. You have to pick your battles. No good news calls after midnight. Elizabeth knows this from personal experience. Instead of wading into the swelling sea of the blackest of what-ifs, she dares to think that maybe the call's the wrong number, or a prank, and Tommy just forgot to text her and she'll yell at him tomorrow about his selfish forgetfulness. Getting mad is better than the alternative. There are other maybes, of course. There will be thousands more. The phone rings again. Elizabeth rushes into the hallway and past the kids' rooms. Tommy's door is closed, sealed. Kate's is open halfway and she's still asleep. The ringing phone doesn't wake her. It doesn't even make her twitch. Maybe Tommy's phone ran out of juice, lost its charge, and he's being a good boy, calling home on the landline to say goodnight. But if his phone died, then he wouldn't uh, then wouldn't he text her from Josh's or Luis's cell phone and not wake her so late with a call? She wonders if Tommy even remembers his own home phone number anymore. He's been so absent-minded and self-consumed, 
in that new teen world he has just begun exploring, there's no telling what he's thinking anymore. She's in the living room, hardwood floor cold and grainy under her feet. Kate was supposed to vacuum up the sand she and her friend Sam tracked all over the house after they'd come home from the pond. Elizabeth finally reaches the end table and extends a hand out to the phone. Its small, dis its small display screen glows a sickly green. Caller ID reads Griffin Harold. It's a call from Josh's house, so it's not the hospital or the police or... Elizabeth says quickly, yes, hi, hello. Mrs. Sanderson? Hi, this is Josh. Having read Josh's father's name on this display screen, Elizabeth was expecting Harry's cheerful baritone. It's like the phone itself is breaking a promise. She wasn't expecting Josh, and the way he sounds, his voice, so light, careful. What is it, Josh? What's wrong? Is, um, is Tommy there? Did he go back home? What do you mean? Why isn't he with you? Elizabeth hurries back into the hallway, into Tommy's room. I don't know. Don't know where he went. We went up to Borderland tonight just to hang out, and he took off into the woods. Is, is he there? There with you? I, I was hoping maybe he went home. Josh is talking fast now, and reckless with words, spilling over each other, overlapping. Josh, slow down. I can't understand you. I'm checking his room now. Elizabeth opens Tommy's door without knocking, which is something she hasn't done all summer, and thinking, please be home, please be home, please be home, and clumsily slaps at the wall switch. She squints into the obnoxious light, and Tommy's bed is unmade and empty. He's not in his room. Elizabeth quickly walks back out into the hallway, turning on lights wherever she goes, looking to see if Tommy is randomly somewhere else in the house, like a misplaced pair of sneakers. He's not in Kate's room. He's not in her room, or the kitchen, or the living room. She turns on the floodlights at the back porch, and there's no one there. No, no, he's not here. He's not, you sure? He's not here, Josh. She's not quite yelling, but there's that same undercurrent of you're a dumbass Tommy's been using with his sister too often lately. Elizabeth runs downstairs into the musty basement, calls out to her son, but he's not there either. Why would he be there, anyway? Because he has to be somewhere. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Sanderson, I'm sorry, oh my god, Josh says, and then breathes heavily into the phone, sending sharp blasts of static. He's crying, or working up to it. Elizabeth clings desperately to annoyance and anger at Tommy's clever, gregarious best friend, who has inexplicably morphed into a mewling child, a child who has stupidly lost her son. She says, okay, wait, quickly, tell me again, let's figure this out. You were at Borderlands? What were you doing? Josh spins through his quick and sloppy story about their hiking through the woods behind his backyard and into Borderlands State Park, and then Tommy going off into the woods by himself, and they haven't seen him since. Elizabeth hears Josh's parents talking in the background. When was the last time Tommy was with you? Oh, more than an hour, maybe two. Jesus Christ, and you're only calling me now? Elizabeth is still walking around her one-level ranch-style home, fighting the urge to open closets and cabinets, to look under the beds. The landline is pressed against her cheek, and she watches her cell phone screen for a text for anything from Tommy. We tried to find him, I swear, and we called for him, waited, looked around, but he didn't come back, and we didn't know what to do, so then we walked back thinking, he doubled back on us, but he wasn't there, and he's not answering his phone or anything. All right, did you, did you try calling anyone else? Where's your mom and dad? Mom's right here. Josh is crying now, for real. She wanted me to call you, hoping he was there. I'm sorry he's not there. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, shh. We can't panic. Listen, it'll be okay, Josh. She regrets saying that, even if it's only to placate Josh. She can't help but feel like she's jinx jinxing her son by saying that out loud, when clearly there's nothing okay about any of this. She asks, did Luis try calling his parents? No, not. Tell him to call his parents, then call Tommy's other friends, see if he went over one of their houses. Elizabeth is not sure who those other friends would be, whose house he would go to instead of Josh's, or Luis's, or home. I will, Miss Anderson. There's a pause. Elizabeth needs to hang up, but is afraid to. Once she does, then the rest of this, whatever this ends up being, will have to continue. She says, call me back as soon as you find out anything. Okay. Tell your parents, <coughs> never mind, I'll call back soon. Elizabeth hangs up and drops the landline headset to the couch. And just like that, the call is over. The air conditioner clicks and whirs to life again. It's so loud, like a plane taking off. She's alone in the living room, shivering and cupping her hands, or cupping her glowing cell phone in her hands. She doesn't know what to do and thinks about waking up Kate to tell her what's happening, even though she doesn't know what it is exactly that's happening. Elizabeth calls Tommy's cell phone and it goes right to voicemail. Tommy's voice says, beep, 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 
then a pause, then he shouts a long and protracted beep, and then the electronic beep sounds off, and there's this hiss of you are now being recorded silence. And she hesitates to leave a message, hesitates to say anything, because somehow she might say the wrong thing and make this all even more wrong than it already is. She says, Tommy, we don't know where you are, and we're all worried. Get, call me as soon as you get this. Love you. Bye. Then hangs up. That's not enough. There has to be something else she can do to summon Tommy back from wherever he is, short of running up and down the street screaming his name. There must be something she can do before she calls the police. Elizabeth feels that call the police clock ticking out on her already, even though Tommy's friends haven't called everyone else yet. Everything is already moving so fast, and yet so slow at the same time. First, she goes back to her text screen and the thread of messages she exchanged with Tommy. She resists the urge to scroll back and read and reread the old texts with the crazy hope that she'll find them there hidden within his messages from the very recent past. Elizabeth is still shivering and her hands are shaking and heavy. Her texting fingers and thumbs are the equivalent of a desperate pleading voice. She types, please call home, please come home, send. She covers her eyes and says to herself, in the quiet house, this can't be happening. Not again. Then she calls the police. All right, so that's the first chapter. Sounds like fun. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a smaller section, uh, and we'll call it a night for me <laughs> there. So this is a little bit forward, that, uh, only like on page 35. So, you know, she's called the police, and the, the police are now searching. You know, they're starting in the local state park you know, to search for where, where Tommy went. Because as far as anybody knows, he, they, him and his two friends snuck out into the park at night, and he just took off. Um, so this is like a full day after she's, uh, Elizabeth, Tommy's mother, is in her bathroom and just trying to like figure out how she's going to wind down and you know, maybe attempt to sleep at some point here. And she's thinking about what had happened to her, her husband, William. Her husband, William, five or six years earlier, had actually ran off on them disappeared for a little while, but then uh, showed up dead, you know, drunk driving, six months after he'd taken off. All right, so we're going to pick up here. During the first few months of Will's absence, Kate would occasionally try out from room to room and call out Daddy. Tommy refused to talk about his father and would avoid his sister when she called to him or asked questions about where he was. But that phase of their grief passed in a blink. The days spent in the company of their father were soon outnumbered by their days without him. When Tommy turned 10, he took up coin collecting like his father had, and he was obsessed with it initially, but he eventually gave it up for video games and general pre-teenagerdom. As the kids got older, the idea that they once knew their father became a less real thing and more like a folktale. He was this guy they barely remembered and only heard about in stories, saw in pictures. The kids never had that full sense of grief and loss as they didn't really understand what they were missing. So it was Elizabeth and Elizabeth alone who still quietly grieved for the failure of their marriage, the disappearance, and the sudden death of a man she had once loved madly. Elizabeth gargles and spits twice, then shuts off the light with the water still running. The darkness in the bathroom is complete. She leans on the sink, her palms, her palms flush against the cold granite, drops her head, chin into her chest and listens to the trickle of running water in the sink until it sounds like murmuring voices, no voices in particular, certainly not her own. Maybe the water could talk her into sleeping if she left it running, running long enough to carve out a canyon in her sink. She turns the faucet off and darts quickly to her left and out of the bathroom, her hands and mouth still dripping wet. Weak streetlight filters through the partially shaded windows, giving the larger shapes in her bedroom outlines to be filled in. She trips on her flip-flops and clothes she left in the middle of the floor. Earlier, when sloughing off the skin of the day, she didn't make it to the green plush chair that dots the far corner of the room, her usual dumping ground. Elizabeth swears, bends over, brails her hands along the floor, and gathers the flip-flops, a pair of sneakers, and a small pile of clothes. From her knees, she twists to her right, aiming to throw everything on, on or at the green chair, and throw it as hard and as dangerously as she can, like she's throwing rocks at a hornet's nest. If she misses and the sneakers crash into the window, or her shorts fly behind the chair to never be seen again, then fuck it, that's fine by her. As she twists and tosses her armload of stuff at the dark lump of the chair in the corner, she sees something further to the right, on the floor, between the chair and the little white end table on which Kate painted purple flowers, 
that something is up against the wall, taking up the dark space and filling it with more dark, the shape of a person crouched, or sitting tightly wrapped into a ball, knees folded into his chest and arms wrapped around those knees, sitting there waiting patiently to be seen, or to be found, or he's so cold and is trying to keep warm, or he's hiding from something terrible. And it's Tommy, it's him. It's Tommy sitting there folded up in that suddenly expansive space between the chair and her TV and the wall. And it's him because of the way, even only as a shape in the dark, he tilts his head while looking at her as if to say, don't you see me, Mom? Then something happens to his face and it happens in a flash, in less than a blink, it becomes visible, or part of it does, and it looks lumpy, misshapen, and where the eyes are, there are two dots. The vision ends as her sneakers, as her sneakers wildly tumble into the plush chair, and a white t-shirt flutters on top of the end table, and then slides lifelessly to the floor. The noise that comes out of her throat is some ancient and awful involuntary precursor to language, and then she says Tommy repeatedly, and as desperately as an incantation. She scrambles on her hands and knees toward where she saw him a moment ago. She reaches her hand into the space, still saying his name. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. She stands and looks behind the chair and all around the room, saying his name attached to a question mark. She runs her hands along the chair and the end table, and his smell, the smell is there. She gasps and greedily inhales, reprieves breaths after drowning. She smells Tommy, he's still there, and he is sweaty. She giggles despite herself. It's as though he's been out running around with his friends all summer afternoon and came back home slightly sunburned, pink cheeks, and his brown hair gone black with sweat. His smell is a sharp, not wholly unpleasant tang of the inside of wet sneakers. That same smell that day before would have had her asking him if he'd remembered to put on deodorant or if he'd showered that day. And he'd be embarrassed, but smiled at frustrating but handsome, I know something you say you only know smile too. Like that body of his with some newfound power that he didn't fully know how to use or control. Elizabeth breathes in more, laughing and crying, and that new, more adult Tommy smell is still there, and she's inhaling so fast and so deeply, her head goes dizzy, and white stars pinprick her vision, and she tries to blink them away. The smell changes, gradually, and becomes something less recognizably Tommy, and more earthy, like grass and soil that has been run on all afternoon, then wet pine needles and moss, and then there isn't any smell at all. Elizabeth steps between the chair and the end table and crouches down, careful not to disturb anything. She sits like he was sitting, with her back against the wall and her arms around her knees. The two phones in her pocket press up against her thighs, and Tommy's smell is faded, already becoming a memory, an imperfect one, one that she'll never be able to fully describe. She leans her head against the chair and cries great, racking sobs that disappear into a gaping interior void, a void into which her bones and whatever flagging spirit that filled them collapses, but truly, or because she truly believes Tommy has somehow visited her, and that means her son is not lost, or a runaway, or a, or a, or a runaway, or is anything else but dead. I had like a shot of tea before I started reading, so I was like, ah, I want to thank you to Niels and to everybody for coming. Uh, you know, this has been a great night, and looking forward to hearing my good friend John Reed, and even looking forward to Sean speaking again. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Paul? <coughs> Matthew? Was that Tommy's ghost, or was she just hallucinating? Uh, I will not tell you. The woman in front of Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> Is that something that's already been published? It's gonna, so that book I just wrote from is, uh, is coming out June 21st. Who's putting it out? Uh, William Morrow. Woo! I don't know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> On the solstice, no, yeah. Yeah, longest day. You'll have all that daylight to buy a new book. <laughs> well, John, with your, your writing process, about um, how long would you say it takes you on average to write your books? Uh, so this is actually, I can't, it's hard. It's, almost amazing to say, it's like my sixth novel, or fifth and a half, I co-wrote a novel with Stephen Graham Jones, and they've all been a little different. Um, this book, I had a two book deal with William Morrow, so A Head Full of Ghosts I wrote just about a year, but I wrote it on my own time. And uh, you know, I gotta admit, I totally respect writers who are able to do nothing but write for their job, and to have that be like their life pressure. Mm -hmm. Because just having like 
I have to write this next book. I didn't know what it was. Basically, in a year after that was one of the hardest things I've done in a long time as a writer. Um, and it almost killed me. Yeah, you know, just in a sense, not like actual uh, killed me. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, hopefully the result's good. Like I, I have not worked as hard on any other book that I've written as I've worked on Disappearance in Devil's Rock. It's my longest book. I you know, did the most edits on it um, for a while. I was pretty nervous about it, but um, how, how I feel long really is good. It? It's uh, I think in words, it's 105,000 words. A handful of ghosts was like 84,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all my other novels were first person, um, and this mm -hmm. is third person that you know jumps around a little bit. Um, yeah, but I, hopefully people like it. I mean, it's definitely it's different than a handful of ghosts, but you know that should be a good thing. You, know, you can't. Rewrite the same book every time. Wouldn't want to, even if I could. Anybody else before I ask my question? Oh boy. You just mentioned that the, the, a shift in perspective mm -hmm. from your previous work to these two. And these two also focus very much on domestic horror and parental sure. anxiety. Do you think that shift in perspective is related to that? Uh, definitely. I mean, geez, you know, for really a lot of my writing, you particularly my short stories, it usually involves children or, or, or parents, you know, worrying about their children. I don't know, to me, being like a, being a kid and being a teenager, which is, th this book is more about being a teen. I don't know, it's just a fascinating thing to me because it's one of the few universal, um, universal experiences for, for everybody. It's like everybody's been, you know, everybody that is in here has been a kid and has been a teenager and knows how just weird that is. Um, I don't know, and I've always found myself going back and forth between the point of view of a kid, because in a lot of ways I still view myself as a kid. And being a parent and a teacher, it's also weird to see it from that other point of view as well. And I have a lot of anxiety from both sides, and so I continually sort of go back to that. I'll stop after this one, but um, a head full of ghosts, you, you go into the whole reality TV thing a lot, and the, the Bigfoot show, and the Survivor Man <laughs> show, and all yeah. that stuff. Um, do you watch reality television? Is that what inspired that part of the book, or? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's why my daughter at the time was huge into finding Bigfoot, so you know we would watch that together. But yeah, I like watching Les Straub, Survivor Man, those sort of like yeah. cheesy pseudo scientific <laughs> reality shows. And with the handful of ghosts, once I decided that I was gonna sort of comment not only on horror movies but pop culture in general, I sort of it was very freeing. It gave myself permission to just to throw everything in there, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a lot of fun for a handful of ghosts. To me, the most fun was you know, being able to have all those pop cultural references. Because I watch reality TV with my teenage kids yeah. too, so it's, it was fun to read while that was happening. So. I have a friend, uh, just really quickly, who uh, gave a handful of ghosts to Renee from Finding Bigfoot. Mm. But I haven't heard back from her. But I guess she's like, Renee! <laughs> 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 Before John comes up, I just want to make a, a. I just want to say really quickly, thank you all for coming to this. Like, uh, being awesome. it, and you know, thank you to Nielsen Carmen, and you should remember to go read your Carmen and Eddie. Uh, and also, there are copies of, of Paul's most recent novel, Handful of Ghosts, um, for sale over there, and he would be really glad to sign them if Absolutely. you bought them. <laughs> so, uh, get the thanks. And uh, thanks again for Paul. Well, Have the uh, the delightful, and I do mean that, John Langan, who is that strangest of animals, a very accessible postmodernist. His work is both literary and playful, and some of it's really fucking dark. So, ladies and gentlemen, and Paul Tremblay, John Langan. <laughs> That's fine. Little did I know. Um, yeah, I, I, to sound like a broken record, uh, thank you so much for coming out for this tonight. Um, and uh, some of you have come very far. Um, who wins the prize for coming farthest tonight? Matthew, Matthew, Matthew you, New, New York City. City. Yeah. 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 
that is stalkerish dedication. <laughs> but, uh, and, and thanks so much to Niels for, for, uh, for doing this, for SJ for, for hosting it. Um, it's, uh, it's a great thrill, and uh, I love Providence. It's great to be back here. So, um, I'm going to read a story called, or <laughs> I'm going to read from a story called Corpse Mouth. Um, some months ago, Ellen, actually a couple of years ago, Ellen Datlow, um, the editor of science fiction, fantasy, horror anthologies, contacted me and said, uh, I'm putting together a monster anthology of reprints. And I thought, oh, okay, I've got some stuff that you could use. And she said, no, no, would you write me an original story? And I thought, oh, that's great, I love monsters. Um, and uh, I was at another reading, another function that Ellen was at, and um, I was talking to a friend about some dental work I had done where they put uh, a bone graft in of uh, cadaver bone um, to get me ready for dental implants. And I said quite chilly, oh, just call me corpse now. And then I thought, oh, corpse now, there you go, it's real, you know? I think we both sort of raced home to see who would get the story and the corpse now story done first, you know? Uh, so I'm just going to read um, the first couple of sections of it and then... Um, a, uh, a, a somewhat uh, sort of story within the story uh, that's a little bit later in it. I once went to a reading where a guy got up and he said, my girlfriend and I broke up this summer. I wrote about 400 poems about it. I'd like to read them all to you now. <laughs> <laughs> it ended with him rolling around on the floor screaming. And that was there. <laughs> and that was there. <laughs> Oh, it says being videotaped. I need to get that. Uh, I need to get that release back. <laughs> <laughs> so, in July of 1994, the year after my father died, my mother, youngest sister, and I went to Greenock, Scotland, from which my parents had emigrated to the United States almost 30 years before. Mom and Mackenzie flew over for a month. I joined them two weeks into their trip. The three of us stayed with my father's mother, who owned a semi-detached house set near the top of a modest hill. From the window of its front bedroom on the second story, you could look out on the River Clyde, hear a tidal estuary, which had allowed the region to become a center for British shipbuilding for over two centuries. Two miles across, the river's far shore was layered with green hills, the Trossachs, long and sloping, the markers of geological traumas, ancient and extreme. I actually arrived a day late, this is true, because of a mechanical difficulty with my plane that was not detected until we were ready to pull away from the gate. The pilot's intimation of it in his message to the passengers caused a woman seated ahead of me to start shouting, oh my God, I had a dream about this last night. We're going to crash, the plane is going to crash, we can't take off. Fortunately for her, and possibly the rest of us, we were removed from the plane and bused to one of the airport's hotels where we were put up overnight. I spent part of that time trying to phone someone on this side of the Atlantic who could call my relatives overseas to let them know not to go to the airport for me. I had no luck and passed the remainder of the night restless from the knowledge that I would have to be up early if I didn't want to miss the return bus to the terminal. I wasn't certain why I had taken the time off from the optometrist's office I was managing for this trip. Obviously, it had to do with the loss of my father, with an effort to address the gap his death had left in my life by returning to the place of his birth and early life, by spending time with the members of his family who still lived there, as if geography and blood might help to heal the edges of what remained a ragged wound. Already, though, my plan seemed off to a dubious start. The sleep I managed was troubled. I fell into a dream in which I watched my father as he sat with a handful of other men in the back of a van speeding along a narrow street that ran between high brick walls blackened by age. Overhead, what might have been the gnarled branches of trees peeked down from the tops of the walls. My father looked as he had during my later childhood, slender, his hair already fled from the top of his head. He was dressed in a denim work, sheet, work shirt and jeans, as were the rest of the men. Although he did not look at me, I was certain he knew that I was watching him, and I waited for him to turn to me and say something. He did not. Despite my concerns, I woke in plenty of time and had an uneventful flight across the ocean, 
and was met at the, at the airport in Glasgow by one of my older cousins and my mother and sister. They checked the flight information before leaving for my original arrival, learned of the alteration to my trip, and saved themselves the earlier run to the airport. Although the ride to my grandmother's wasn't especially long, I was still feeling the effects of my night in the airport hotel. I was too much of a nervous flyer to have napped during my time in the air, and I struggled to hold open my eyelids, which felt weighted with lead. I had a confused impression of stone and steel buildings, of cars and trucks flowing around us, of a strip of blue river speeding by on my right. When we arrived at my grandmother's house, I succeeded in greeting her and one of my aunts and a couple of my cousins, but it wasn't long before I climbed the stairs to the front bedroom, assuring everyone that I just needed a little nap and slept straight through to the next morning. Somewhere deep in that sleep, I dreamed I was standing at the picture window overlooking the Clyde. It was night, but the sky shone silver white with the gloaming, casting sufficient light for me to see that the river was dry. Its bed was a wide, muddy trench bordered by rocky margins draped with seaweed. At points further out in the mud, boulders sat alone and in clumps. Thousands, tens of thousands of fish lay on the mud and rocks, their long silver bodies catching the light. Most of them were dead, a few still thrashed. All along the riverbed, a great line of people walked downstream towards the ocean. Male, female, old, young, tall, short, fat, thin, they were as varied a group as you could assemble, as was their dress. Some were in their work clothes, some in their pajamas, some in formal wear, some in hospital gowns, some wearing the uniforms of their profession, some stark naked. The only detail they shared was their bare feet. They trudged through mud that sucked at their ankles, that slurped at their shins, that surged around their thighs. If they were closer to shore, they stumbled on seaweed, slid on rocks. They trod on fish, kicked them out of the way. <coughs> it seemed to me that there was something I wasn't seeing, a presence waiting the scene in front of me. It was waiting at the corners of my vision, huge and old and empty. Or not empty so much as hungry. There was no sound from the crowd, but overhead I heard a high-pitched ringing, like what occurs when you run your damp finger around the rim of a wine glass. Let's skip ahead just a little. Of course, that's all the best stuff I'm skipping. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Just for you. So the, the narrator's uncle has uh, agreed to take him uh, and his sister on a tour of the uh, of the area, show them around the, the place that uh, show them around the place that their father grew up in. So once he was home from work the next day, Uncle Stuart made good on his promise tour of the area. Mackenzie, the sister, came too. The three of us squeezed into his car, a white Nissan Micra whose cramped interior lived up to its name, and off we went. A soft-spoken man, Stuart kept a cigarette lit and burning between his lips for most of the drive. He worked for a high-tech manufacturer who had moved into one of the old shipping buildings. He was what my parents called crafty, which meant he had a knack for artistic projects. Fifteen years before, when he'd been laid off his job at the shipyards and unable to find another, he had turned his efforts to building doll-sized replicas of old, horse-drawn travelers' trailers. He gifted one to my parents, who placed it in their bedroom, where my siblings and I went to admire it. The detail on the trailer was amazing, from the flowered curtains hung inside the small windows to the ornaments on the porcelain <coughs> horse's bridle. He bought the horses in bulk from a department store. Stewart had sold his trailers, first to family, then to friends, then to friends of friends, then to their friends, the money he earned helping to keep his family afloat until he found a new job. He was also a repository of local knowledge, some of which he shared with Mackenzie and me as he steered the micro up and down Greenock's steep streets. He showed us the house our father had grown up in, the apartment where our mother had been raised by her mother, the church where our parents had married. He drove us down to the river, to the esplanade, and along to where a few cranes stood at the water's edge like enormous steel insects. He drove us east, out of town, towards Glasgow, so that he could show us Dumbarton Rock across the Clyde, a great rocky molar whose ragged crown stood 200 feet above the river. A scattering of stone blocks was visible at the summit. Nodding at the rock, Stuart said, There's been a castle of some sort there forever. The words emerging from his mouth in puffs of cigarette smoke that his open window caught and sucked out of the car. Back when the Vikings held the mouth of the Clyde and the islands, that was the westernmost stronghold of the British. Before that, the local kings ruled from atop it, 
like the castle in Edinburgh, Stirling too. There's a story that Merlin played the place of, paid the place a visit in the sixth century. King Arthur's Merlin, I said. Aye. The king at the time was called Ritter. They called him the Generous. King Arthur's nephew, Hole, was passing through, and he was injured, fell off his horse or the like. King Ritter put him up while he was healing. When Ritter's foes learned he had King Arthur's nephew under his roof, they laid siege to the place. Ritter had a magic sword, Dernwen, that burst into flame whenever he drew it, but he and his men were pretty badly outnumbered. There was no way he could get word to King Arthur down in Camelot in time for it to do him any good. It looked as if Arthur's nephew was going to be killed while under Ritter's care. So was Ritter himself, but you see what I'm saying. It would be a big dishonor for Ritter, alive or dead. Stuart steered toward an exit on the left that took us to a roundabout. He followed it halfway around until we were heading back toward Greenock. As he did, he said, this was when Marilyn showed up. He'd been keeping an eye on Hole, and he'd seen the trouble Ritter was in for his hospitality to Arthur's kin. He presented himself to the king and offered his assistance. No offense, says Ritter, but you're one man. There's a thousand men at my front door. What can you do about a force of that size? Well, says Marilyn, the king has a point. He is only one man, and although his father was a devil, there is a limit to his power. However, says he, I have allies I can call upon for help, and against them no force of men can stand. Then I wish you'd ask those friends for their aid, says Ritter. Marilyn says okay. He tells the king he needs a corpse. The fresher the better. It just so happens that, earlier that very day, Ritter's men caught a couple of their enemies attempting to sneak over the castle wall. He has his men bring them before him, and right on the spot, executes the pair. There you go, he says to Marilyn. There's two corpses for you. Good, says Marilyn. He has the king's soldiers carry the bodies right outside the front gate. It's going on nighttime, and Ritter's foes have withdrawn to their tents. Marilyn instructs the soldiers to dig a shallow grave, one big enough for the two dead men. Once it's been dug, he has them lay the corpses in it and cover them over. Then he sets to, using his staff to draw all manner of strange characters in the soil. He was a great one for writing, was Marilyn. If you read some of the older stories about him, he's always writing on things, prophecies of coming events, usually. <clears throat> King Ritter watches him, but he doesn't recognize the characters Marilyn scratching into the dirt. When he's done, Marilyn steps back from the grave. Pretty soon, the earth begins to tremble. It moves from somewhere deep below them, as if something's digging its way up to them. Over in the siege camp, a few of Ritter's enemies have been watching Marilyn's show. As the ground shakes, more of them run to see what's causing the disturbance. The soil over the grave jumps, and a great head pushes its way through the dirt. It's a man's head, but it's the size of a hut. The hair is clotted with earth. The skin is all leathery, shrunk to the skull. The eyes are empty pits. The lips are blackened, pulled back from teeth the size of a man's arm. The arms and legs of the bodies the king's men buried hang out over the teeth. The remainder of the corpse is inside the huge mouth. It's a giant Marilyn summoned, but no such giant as anyone there has ever heard tell of. It's as much an enormous corpse as those it crunches between its teeth. It keeps coming, head and neck, shoulders and arms, chest and hips, until it towers above them. You can imagine the reaction of Ritter's foes, sheer panic. The king and his men aren't too, aware, aren't too far away from it themselves. Marilyn touches his arm and says, steady. He points to the siege camp and says to the monster, right, those are for you. The giant doesn't need to be told twice. It takes a couple of steps and it's in the midst of the enemy fighters, most of whom are trampling each other in their haste to get away from it. It leans down, sweeps up a handful of men and stuffs them into its mouth. It stomps others like their ants. It kicks campfires apart, catches men, and tears them to pieces. A few try to fight it. They grab their spears and swords and stab it. But that leathery skin is too tough. Their blades can't pierce it. Soon the giant's feet are covered in gore. Its lips and chin are smeared with the blood of the men it's eaten. There's no satisfying the thing. It continues to jam, screaming men into its mouth. In a matter of a few minutes, Marilyn's monster has broken the siege. In a few more, it's routed Ritter's foes. Some of them flee to the ships they sailed here. The giant pursues them, smashes the prows of the ships, breaks off a mast, and uses it as a club on ships and men alike. King Ritter turns to Marilyn and says, What is this thing you brought forth? That, says Marilyn, is corpse mouth. <laughs> corpse mouth, says Ritter, him I have not heard of. <laughs> Marilyn says, he and, his he and his brethren were worshipped here many a long year ago. 
He was not known as Corpse Mouth then, but what his original name was has been lost. He and his kindred were replaced by other gods, who were replaced by newer gods than those, and so on until the Romans brought their gods, and now the Christians theirs. All of Corpse Mouth's fellows went to the place old gods go when men are done with them, the graveyard of the gods. Corpse Mouth, though, refused to suffer the same fate as his kin. Instead, he lived on their remains. If any men stumbled across him, they were his. As later generations of gods came to the graveyard, so Corpse Mouth had them too. Down through the ages he's continued, losing hold of everything he used to be, until all that remains is his hunger. Ritter watches the giant crushing the last remnants of his enemies. He says, this is blasphemy. Maybe, Marilyn says, but it saved King Arthur's nephew, and it saved you too, which Ritter can't argue with. Once the last of the enemy fighters is dead, the giant corpse mouth turns in the direction of Marilyn and the king. Ritter puts his hand on his sword, but Marilyn tells him to keep it in its sheath. He points his staff at the hills behind Dumbarton Rock. Corpse mouth nods that great gruesome head and walks off in that direction. That's the last Ritter sees of him, and of Marilyn for the matter. I don't suppose he was too upset about either. Stuart's story had taken us all the way back to his front door. He pulled the parking brake and turned off the engine. And that, he said with a grin, is a wee bit of your local history. <laughs> Mackenzie and I thanked him for the story and for the tour. While we were walking up to the house, my sister said, where did Marilyn send the monster? Corpse mouth. Our uncle paused at the front door. The story doesn't say, maybe north to the mountains. That's where many terrible and awful beasts were said to dwell. I'll tell you what I think. A few miles east of Dumbarton Rock, there was an old burial place unearthed in the 1930s. It was the talk of this part of the country. I remember my father speaking about it. The fellows who dug it up said they found evidence of an ancient temple there. Scotland Stonehenge, the papers called it. What happened to it, I said. Can you visit it? They put a pair of apartment buildings over the spot, Stuart said. The war interrupted the excavation. Then, when the war was over, another group of scientists said the chaps who discovered the place had overstated its significance. There were a few rock carvings that were of interest, they said, but as long as they were removed and sent to the museum in Glasgow, they saw no reason not to build the high-rises there. So the men from the museum came and cut out the pieces of rock to be preserved, and the rest became part of the foundation for the new construction. My father was upset about it, about all of it, but especially about the carvings being taken away. There's folk put they things there for a reason, he says, and young men from the museum would do well enough to leave them be. There's no telling what trouble they'll stir. I suppose he had a point. Although, Stuart added, I've yet to see any giants prowling the hills. But if you ask me, that's where Marilyn told Corpse Mouth to go. Thank you. Thanks. collection will be out, I hope, in the middle part of the year. I have to finish writing the original story for it, which I swear I am almost done with. Um, so July, I hope, it's called Sephira and Other Betrayals. Um, and the novel, my, my next novel, I'm just waiting on some publisher-related negotiations. So um, <clears throat> Probably the same time of year, actually. I'll probably two books out at the same time of the year, so I don't know if that'll be good or bad. And who's putting the collection out? The collection is Hippocampus. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Chris? If you could put Corpse Mouth into any canonical universe, which would it be and why? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I already thought to myself, I already have another, <coughs> the next novel I'm thinking of, of writing. I thought, oh, this guy would slot right in there. Oh, cool. I was all pleased with myself. <laughs> Which, you know, my wife would tell you was a common occurrence. <laughs> okay. So, uh, is Corpse Mouth set up to go on a rampage in the modern world or not? Or You'll have to read Ellen Datlow's The Monstrous <laughs> to find out. <laughs> Which I believe is available at the Look Up Arts and Sciences? Let's say it is. Let's say it is. <laughs> As is John's most recent collection. Yes. And speaking of Lovecraft Arts and Sciences, while well, I have you guys here for a second, 
It's so much more than a bookstore. It's a bookstore, it's a gallery, it's a museum, and it's become a community center in a very real way for, you know, even casual fans of horror and weird fiction. And it's a pretty wonderful thing that Carmen has done. Oh, it is too. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, we hope you've had a good time and go spend some money. And while you're, <laughs> while you're there, pick up a copy of Paul's book, Head yes. of Ghost, because that's really brilliant. There's also a journal there uh, called Thinking Horror. Stay away from that. That <laughs> Sean is involved in editing. And this is an attempt, um, the first one in a, in a while, I guess, to put together um, a kind of scholarly journal. And that sounds really dre dreadfully dry. But non-academic. Right? But a non-academic <laughs> scholarly journal about horror and what's going on in, in horror right now. So there are interviews with a bunch of really great contemporary writers, uh, Nathan Ballingrud, who mm -hmm. else? Uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, Molly Tanzer, Simon Strancis, Michael Kelly, Nate Southerd. Like and Nathan, and, 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 and Nathan, Nathan right, you know, as, as well as some really neat articles, um, some really provocative stuff. So um, it seems to me there's nothing else like it out there right now, and I really appreciate the time and the effort that Sean and, and Simon and everybody else has, has put into this. So these are the kinds of things that we have them and we're like, oh, I mean to get a copy, yeah, I'm going to get a copy of that, and then we never do, and then they disappear. And then we're like, oh man, whatever, I always want to get a, co get a copy of it. Now, do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question for Sean. You have a question? I have a question for you. Oh, why? No, you don't. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Um, you mentioned that you get to keep the bone. Yeah, it's there. It's in there? It's there. It's part of me. It's, 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 they, they do something with, um, I had had a couple, I had like, Tooth trouble, I never took care of Take care of your teeth. <laughs> All right? You have been a dentist recently? You've got a dead man inside that. you. Okay. I have, yeah, I'm haunted. Um, so no, what had happened was I had the teeth pulled, and then I had bone loss. Because once the teeth are removed, the, the bone starts to just, like, disintegrate. So uh, they take repurposed. So also donate your bodies to science. <laughs> because the way my teeth are going, I may need more of this. <laughs> And so yeah, they take the bone and they somehow they denature it so you won't so your body won't reject it. They cut you open, they slap it in there, they give you happy pills so you have no idea this is happening. And um, the next thing you know is like the ghost in Mrs. Muir. I actually have the ghost of a fifty year old Russian man who follows me everywhere. Right? I, think we know your, I think we know your next novel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so do you remember any of the titles of Laird's four hundred poems? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the first poem that the guy read went, I should, guy. Keep, he went, I should keep to myself. And he repeated that about 20 times, and at the end he shouted, So I don't get hurt! <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to mock his pain. No, I, 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 I do not. So tonight you've seen original work read by Mr. Jason Eckhart. Some money and good night. <laughs> 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 <laughs>